I'm Doug Powell. Nice to be with you. And I've come here to talk to you about hockey. Now, this was taken 13 years ago, back in Guelph. Uh, I had a lot more hair. The goalie is one of mine. The kid, one down from me, is one of mine. Chapman's at the other end coaching because what use are graduate students if they can't coach hockey? And uh, he's now a prof at North Carolina State. And there's when we won all Ontario and uh, good times. And now I am in Brisbane, Australia. And we decided it was a bit too expensive to try to fly me there. So we're going to try this instead. And hopefully this will work. And I'll be joining you for a chat later on. Now, the nice thing about Brisbane and all the guys I coach with, they're either from Calgary or Vancouver, as far as I can tell because uh, the resource industries are so similar uh, between Queensland and um, Western Canada. And uh, I have a six-year-old daughter who's playing, and this is my Brisbane gang from last year. Don't have a kicker this year. But you know, managing foodborne illness and promoting it is a lot like coaching a kid's hockey team. Because you have these things like all the kids complaining, my helmet's too tight. I have a runny nose. I have to pee. She hurt me. And social media amplifies these concerns. And I've been coaching or playing or even administrating hockey for almost 50 years. And I've heard pretty much everything that way. And it's really no different. Way back in 1809, Aper came up with his food and glass bottles, which we refer to as canning. How many people do you know want to get into a business where they're going to start offering canned food? Do they know what to do? The majority of home canners have reported they do not follow science-based home preservation methods. They receive their information through friends and family, and they don't really know what they're doing. Yet, we see this at markets all the time. Pickled beets that weren't actually pickled. Sick and three. Clostridia botulinum, this is a terrible outbreak that just happened a few months ago at a church potluck. Uh, one person died and 40 got sick with botulism, of which at least seven are still in hospital. And it was because they would used canned potatoes and in a potato salad, but they were not properly canned, and it led to botulism. So there's market opportunities to promote food, but you got to do it right. Now, when we talk about food, we've been doing this for a long time, and our philosophy is that anyone who tries to make a dis distinction between education and entertainment doesn't know the first thing about it either. And Marshall McLuhan said that, and he's the guy who came up with the medium is the message. We've adopted it to it's the medium and the message. You need to use multiple media and multiple messages to get the food safety info out there. And information must be rapid, reliable, relevant, and repeated. And you need to stay on top of your game. Now, this is Bill Keen, who died a couple of years ago, and I still miss him. He was the head epidemiologist for Oregon. And he was a brilliant guy in terms of figuring out where things were coming from. For instance, E. coli 0157 in strawberries killed one person, 14 sick. He was smart enough to go to the strawberry patch and pick up some deer poop, found the exact same strain. Do your strawberry growers know that? Norovirus from a change table. That doesn't have much to do with food production or food marketing, but it sure has a lot to do with restaurants because people take their kids to restaurants or to farms, farm markets, and they change. And Bill figured out that the norovirus was actually resident in the change table and was passed on to other people. Petting zoos and fairs. People are always trying to do this to make a buck. Here in Brisbane, uh, the state fair is called the ECA, for whatever reason. 
In 2013, 50 people, primarily kids, got sick with E. coli 0157. And this was the sign, please use hand sanitizer. We know hand sanitizer, they're not as effective as hand washing. And if you've been to some of these petting zoos, they are a disease outbreak waiting to happen. You see a cute animal, I see a salmonella factory or an E. coli factory. Basic questions. If you're going to market food safety, you better be able to ask, answer them. So, should prepackaged lettuce be washed? When you buy that plastic bag out of convenience because of the nutritional benefits for that, should it be washed? Again, science says no, but a few people say yes. Either way, washing does almost nothing. What has to happen is the bugs have to be controlled before they get on the product as much as possible. And that means an on-farm food safety program. But what's a consumer to think? Food safety should not be faith-based, but it almost always is. Every time we go to a restaurant, we're making a faith-based decision. Even if it does have some disclosure about, I got an A, B, or C, or a red, yellow, green. You probably have heard about the Listeria and Bluebell ice cream that has been going on for several years and uh, has just been made public because they just put the pieces together. It's killed at least three people in Kansas. And people in Texas are saying, my Bluebell ice cream is safe because I pray before I eat it. Other people at that church dinner in Ohio um, the pastor said that the death came because of sin. It did not come because of sin. It came because of bad food safety. And the alternative to HACCP or HACCP light is faith-based. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard this. We've always done it this way, and we've never heard anyone before. Well, not that you know of, and if they're dead, they can't come back and complain. So, where are we at now, and how do we move forward in an intelligent manner? According to CDC data, which is probably the best data in the world, at least it's the most current, um, we're seeing an increase in Campylobacter, a decrease in E. coli 0157, but other shigatoxin-producing E. coli seem to be going up. Listeria, no change. Salmonella, no change, but it's, it's changing in where it shows up and it's more in fresh fruits and vegetables. Vibrio is increasing because everyone likes to eat the raw seafood for whatever reason. I don't get it. Uh, Yersinia has gone down. And there you can see it mapped out over the years. Um, and each bug has differing levels of severity and different levels of concern. All right, you want to market caramel apples? Well, they, uh, sick, they killed seven people and 35 ill. And they found a genetic match in the apple planting pack. These are the risks that anyone needs to be aware of before they get into business. Cantaloupes and salmonella and listeria killed and sickened a lot of people in the last few years. Well, that's one way to market. Absolutely positivity, listeria free. This is the marketing that I see uh, outside. This is in Brisbane at one of the farmer's markets. And they've got every catch slogan on there except microbiologically safe, which is the one I care about. I prefer this. This is something we made up a few years ago. Um, it's a more valuable indicator for buying food. Frozen berries. We got hepatitis A. Uh, the Food Safety Authority of Ireland came out again today, uh, being May 22nd, and said, um, you have to cook your berries for a minute and a half. Now, I don't know if they have a risk assessment uh, to back that up, but 
if you look at where frozen berries come from, uh, they're from all over the world. And you don't know who's handling them and whether Hepe is endemic in the water or in the pickers or whatever. But there's been tens of thousands sickened across Europe. 34 people in Australia have been sickened in a separate outbreak. And people here say, well, we just need to buy local berries. We shouldn't be buying imported berries. And I remind them, well, that's nice because you live in a subtropical climate and we can get berries most of the time of the year. In Ontario, it's a little different. In Calgary, it's really different. So if you're going to market it, make sure you know where it's coming from and what you can do to back up your data. Whoops, wrong way. Uh, close to home, E. coli 0157 and XLB. Lots of problems were uncovered. Canada led the way in providing labeling for mechanically tenderized beef, which is good. The U.S. is now following suit. Um, these are what they came up with. But the interesting thing is just a couple of weeks ago, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency decided to send in a special team to monitor its own inspectors because they uncovered, or they discovered, that the inspectors were sort of, eh, whatever, just go on. And they were a little too close to the company. And we've written papers on this about how audits and inspections are never enough. You have to have a culture of food safety within your organization and promote it. And the best way to do that is to market food safety. And I'll get to that in a minute. Foster Farms, biggest poultry producer on the west coast of the United States, 621 sick with salmonella since March. They say they've improved things, but there's no public data. They told consumers just cook your chicken, which is never enough because cross-contamination is probably the biggest risk in the kitchen, whether it's food service or at home. And if I went to the grocery store and was faced with buying that stuff, I would say, no, I don't want that because you're not taking responsibility for your own safety. And really, this is just a repetition of the Pinto defense. The Pinto had a tendency, some of you may be old enough to remember the Pinto, to blow up when hit from behind. And their initial response was, we meet all government standards. Anytime you hear anyone, whether it's food or anything else, say we meet government standards, walk away. Government standards are minimal. In fact, the head of food safety at Costco, who's a friend of mine, said uh, about a month ago, he said, we go up far above and beyond government standards. They are a minimal standard. The other thing is you want to protect your brand. And brand protection is where the money's to be made if you're going to go forward. And if you forget that, you're going to lose. So leafy greens out of California, they keep bragging about their food safety culture. The whole idea of food safety culture, and we've written about this as well, is it's a nice idea. It was good at the time, but it's really jumped the shark now that everyone is saying it. They don't know what it means. They say we actually want to just train people better. That's not a food safety culture. You want to hold people responsible? Make inspection data public. Have continuous online surveillance. Then go ahead and market food safety at retail. And these leafy green folks, I mean, there's another outbreak in Canada just a week ago that was linked to leafy greens from California. And they stonewall every time there's an outbreak linked to leafy greens. And somehow epidemiology doesn't matter anymore. It's all, you have to find the proof, an exact match. That's rarely going to happen. 
You cannot test your way to a safe food supply, but you use testing to verify that your processes work. So, what do you do? You want to go forward and market your food as being microbiologically safe? Have a story. Make sure you have the science and the data to back that story up, because if you don't, someone's going to figure it out. Forget the zero risk. You talk about reduced risk. Tell your story in a genuine way. You all eat your own food. Be genuine about it. We all have kids. I mean, I've been shamelessly manipulating my five daughters for years and using them in stories. And now I have two grandsons, or the second grandson's about to be born. So tell your story in a genuine way. Things that you would do with your own kids. Things you would do with your own hockey team. Engage in dialogue, both proactively and reactively, and evaluate what works and what doesn't. We know that stories work. We know that we need to put food safety in a context. And you need to have surprising messages. This is all validated in the literature. Understand the audience. Consider all these things. Yeah, this is all repeated. But again, it's all there. Nowadays, they want infographics and videos and visuals. And that's fine. But make sure you have the content right. Because, you know, the UK Food Standards Authority has its Food Safety Week going on right now. And they had a nice little flashy infographic. But they say, your chicken is cooked when the juices run clear and there's no pink. And that's wrong. Your chicken is cooked when it gets to 165 Fahrenheit as validated by a tip-sensitive digital thermometer. And that is the only way, and both Canada and the U.S. recommend, and actually Canada recommends a higher temperature, but the Brits keep saying through their, you know, taxpayer-funded food safety authority that juices run clean. And they put that in an infographic. That's embarrassing. Yeah, we have a large project going on on hamburger cooking, uh, going to restaurants where we like to uh, go out and see what people do and people eat. Um, Got to use a thermometer. And I rarely, when people ask me how do I want my hamburger, I say, 160. And they look at me and they go, uh, I don't know if we have a thermometer back there, so I can check. And then I don't get it. All right, so let's get back to basics, because this is about marketing. What's food safety? Food that doesn't make you bark, or your pets, because there's a lot of pet outbreaks. What is the cornerstone of food safety? Well... There's audits and there's inspections. Yet both of those have been involved in pretty much every food safety outbreak there's ever been. They've been audited, they've been inspected and passed with flowing, with great, you know, reports. They don't work. Instead, if you want to protect your brand, you need to be evaluating the risks of the suppliers yourselves. You need to be evaluating your own practices internally. Hire your own people. Do not farm it out to an auditor. The auditor industry, I mean, I'm not naive enough to think that it's not necessary. The food is so intertwined throughout the world that, of course, there's going to be auditors. So it needs to police itself better and have better risk identification and pay attention to these things that I just mentioned. Companies need to use the audit results if they actually get an audit. Sometimes they just go, yeah, that's nice, thanks. I mean, really what it is is paying attention to the safety. You know, we look at these listeria outbreaks that have happened for decades. 
Sara Lee in 1998, Maple Leaf in 2008. In both cases, there was testing programs in place for Listeria, and they saw the numbers go up. What did they do about it? Ignored it. They hoped it would go away, and that's the combat indifference. Paying attention to the safety in the absence of an outbreak is really challenging. And it's not just outbreaks. This is a common theme throughout technological failures, whether it's BP in Florida, Bhopal in India, Space Shuttle, Columbia. In all three cases, they had lots of indications from their data, from their systems, that things weren't going right. But there's this human condition that says, well, nothing went wrong yesterday. So I think there's a better chance that nothing will go wrong tomorrow. That's wrong. So if you want to market food safety, you make sure you know where you're getting the food from, number one. Make sure it's from safe sources. Do testing, do whatever, but go there and look them in the eye for every ingredient. We should have public disclosure of food safety inspection results because right now they're painful to get. If companies want to brag about this stuff, make it public. There should be mandatory food handler certification anywhere. To coach hockey in Canada, a rep team of seven-year-old girls, I had to have 40 hours of training. When I came to Australia to coach here, I needed 16 hours of training because I didn't recognize Canada. To serve food here, I need nothing. So you tell me what's more important. Put your information out there and stop trying to educate people. Compel them. Make them passionate about your food. Tell them why it's so safe. And when you do that, then you can go back through the system and say, look, we're putting this on the shelves and saying, this is important. We're marketing this stuff. So you better damn well wash your hands back on the farm or at retail or wherever. Because it becomes then ingrained. You want to be food safety leaders? You don't follow perceptions. You create perception. You want more info on this? My uh, colleagues, Don Chapner and Ben Chapman, have a food safety podcast. I don't know. Maybe you have to get stuck in traffic in Calgary and you can listen to that. Uh, we have Barf Blog that's been running for over 10 years. Um, and I always get the same, uh, you know, I've done over 10,000 blog posts. And I still get the same response, and that is people saying, Oh, uh, you don't know the real story when I post something. And I'm like, okay, then why don't you post it? It's a blog. And that's where I get the whole make it public, make the testing data public, make your communications and management public. Tell your own story or someone will do it for you. Because in the end, who represents the public? The people who get sick. Well, these are our families, and we sort of like to represent them. A couple of years old, but eh, we haven't aged that much. Have a story. Have the science and data to back that story up. Tell your story in a genuine way. Thank you very much. And with uh, the technology complying, I hope to enjoy you for a chat, which will be at about... 3 a.m. my time, which is fine, but you might hear some trains in the background. Thank you very much.